All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next panel is titled Data and Deal Making: Using Data to Make a Meaningful Impact on Your Transactions. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. And I'll hand it over to Michael, our moderator. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, hello, it's, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. And it's certainly a pleasure to be with such an esteemed panel uh, as we have assembled today. Uh, I'm Michael Cohn. I'm the Vice President of Advisory Services uh, for CoStar Group. Uh, and I lead our consulting services working with a global who's who of commercial real estate. Uh, and clearly it's obvious why I was chosen to moderate uh, this panel given that I work for CoStar Group, uh, one of the leading real estate information uh, companies uh, in the US. Uh, before we get started with the panel discussion, I'd like to have the panel introduce themselves and the firms uh, that they work with. So uh, Elliot, maybe we'll, we'll start with you first uh, to introduce yourself uh, as well as uh, your firm. Sure, happy to. Thanks, Michael. So uh, my name is Elliot Trencher. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer for Kilroy Realty. Uh, I've been with the firm for about four years. Um, Kilroy, for those who don't know, is a publicly traded office REIT that focuses on uh, the West Coast uh, from San Diego up to Seattle. We specialize in office properties geared towards uh, technology, media, and biotech tenants. And uh, we're about 15 million square feet, give or take. Uh, we are also a um, developer uh, is sort of our specialty. And we have development projects going across um, many of our markets today, uh, totaling about $2 billion, again, focused on life science as well as office. Thank you. John? Thanks, Michael. John Sakaitis with Avis and Young, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, been here for the last uh, two years after about 14 years at JLL. For those who don't know, Avis and Young, uh, Canadian based commercial real estate services and advisory firm uh, that's grown uh, about 25X in the past decade. And uh, our team's really responsible for uh, data analytics, software development, technology, and how we're engaging our clients in the market with that. So, really look forward to today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joshua. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Harris with uh, Scanska USA Commercial Development. Um, we are office and multifamily uh, mixed use developers in mostly urban environments. We are currently active in Boston, DC, Houston, Seattle, and LA. And we are part of the larger uh, Scanska Global Group, which is a, a development and construction operation headquartered out of. Uh, Sweden, and I'm personally headquartered in the U.S., hence my background. Probably. I was going to say, that's Manhattan. not Sweden in back of you. That is Manhattan, and it would be, my office would be when we go in, is at the Empire State Building, actually, which is where the scans for USA headquarters sit. And then Ravathi. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ravathi Greenwood, uh, and I'm the Global Head of Data and Insights at Cushman and Wakefield. And for those of you who don't know Cushman and Wakefield, we are a global full uh, uh, full service uh, real estate services company, uh, and we cover all asset classes. And my particular role is a combination of data and research. In my previous role in Cushman, uh, I used to run our America's research platform, and this kind of combines uh, the two to look at our data strategy. Uh, and I've been with Cushman for about four years now. Ruthie, thank you. Um, before we get into the panel discussion, uh, on data, which is really the focus of uh, today's panel, uh, I'd like to start with an opening uh, question, which is, where are we? Obviously, we're now about 14 months uh, into the pandemic. We're certainly starting to see uh, some, some marked improvement in the economic data to the point where people are actually concerning about the economy overheating, given the CPI and the PPI data that we got uh, this week and some of the equity market responses to it. But uh, I'd like to, each of you uh, obviously have great uh, vision uh, and in insights to where the office market is uh, in your respective uh, areas of activity. Uh, and I'd like to just ask you uh, where you think we are and just generally where you think we're going uh, as, uh, uh, as an industry in terms of US uh, office and demand. So Arivathi, let, let us start with you first. 
Absolutely. So, um, you know, I mean, the office market has seen a lot of kind of uh, secular kind of headwinds as a result of COVID, right? I mean, not none of us, or at least most of us are not in the office right now. Um, and really, I am. Question, oh, you are, okay. <laughs> Um, and, and really the question of a uh, question I think to ask is, you know, how much of this is kind of temporary and how much of this will reverse itself? Because when you kind of track companies that are that are reopening, um, um, most companies have said that they are going to go back, uh, you know, in, in the fall. And I guess uh, the question is, there is going to be some erosion of the whole kind of uh, work from office, work from home. And when I kind of think about it, I split it into two buckets. So there's some proportion of people who will work from home permanently, and that, of course, kind of, uh, you know, takes away from office demand. And then, then there's some proportion that comes back into the office two to three days a week or three to four days a week or whatever that kind of uh, paradigm is. And, and so the question is, how does the office, my office market kind of really kind of accommodate that? And don't forget, you know, as we see GDP growth, we are, we are forecast to see, you know, six to 7% GDP growth this year as a result of, uh, of the stimulus package, um, you know, apart from COVID being reined in, we are also going to create new jobs. So I think that after kind of the 2020 dip, which was quite a lot, we'll probably see a coming back uh, to office in terms of office. Elliot, uh, coming back, uh, is, is that Kilroy's position or uh, are you concerned, particularly given some of the markets that, that you focus on, that is hybrid or uh, work from home? It's a very pertinent question, right, given everything that we're going through right now. And, and I think looking back at the last 14 months, you know, it's fair to, to question that because none of us were going into the office. Uh, I'm back in at, at the moment, uh, but we are still easing our way back into um, coming into the office full time. And I, I tend to think about it as you know, what are employees saying and what are employers saying? Employees are saying we a lot of different things, but, you know, some of the uh, ones that are concerning is when they talk about never wanting to go back and wanting flexibility. There are others that say they want to be back and they yearn and they miss the interaction with those with their colleagues. And so you definitely have a split among what employees are saying. When we look at what employers are saying, um, I think that that bodes more favorably for office demand. Um, I think that executives are starting to come around on uh, wanting to have their uh, their workforce together uh, more often than not. I can tell um, you that's that is CoStar's policy. Uh, we are a return to office uh, firm. Yeah, and just because we've been able to get through the last 14 months uh, without being together, I don't think anyone would say it was optimal. And so, as Revathy said, you know, maybe we're not going in five days a week, but we think that most folks will go in more often than not. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll look back in, at 2020 and say um, that, was, that was the exception, not the rule. Exception, not the rule, John, or uh, you're seeing it differently, Davis and Young? Seeing it a little differently, to be honest. Um, one, I think from a um, from a data perspective, we're looking at kind of different types of data, which are more minute by minute, kind of day by day, to really yep. come up how quickly um, the market's either coming back or not. And, and obviously, that's you know, you, mainly you, using a bunch of different data sets, but particularly mobility data. Um, in terms of modeling out kind of tens of thousands of points across kind of key cities, we're seeing most cities are kind of returning at a level of activity around anywhere from upper teens to upper to 40% kind of in the south, southwest. But when you look at office buildings uh, and what we've modeled out there, it's generally hovering from anywhere from 5% up to kind of 20% at a height. Um, from me, what's most concerning there is not the drop from COVID, but pre-COVID. If you look at the variation that kind of existed utilizing kind of that mobility and activity data for the three and a half years prior, there's a variation in terms of office activity at office buildings ranging anywhere from 30 to 55%. And actually is very much in line with what I hear from our corporate clients as well as um, corporates that we're kind of engaged with that 
most are trying to address through COVID the inherent vacancy that existed in their portfolio pre-COVID. Mm. Now, the vacancy we see every quarter has nothing to do with the corporate vacancy. <laughs> we see vacancy of five, 10% in markets, but in, in reality, most office spaces and buildings were never more than 70% occupied in a given space. And I think a lot of corporates are taking that measure to, let's be honest, attack that. Um, the, the last piece I'll say is that I think we have to look at kind of the interests in the market. And, and what we're hearing a lot, particularly from technology firms, is the big five have made a very public stance in terms of return to office. The ones outside of the big five potentially are exposing that from a talent recruitment perspective. Because of what Elliot said before, if you're one of those big five and you're enforcing a work from office or work from office with a little bit of flexibility, and let's just call it your number eight or 10 or 12 on that list, and you also have a mandate to grow, one of your incentive points to do that is to offer potentially an employee base different perks. One of those perks obviously could be a flexible environment. So, so I, yeah, the, the, as someone who's always you know, covered the office sector, you know, it, it's, um, I, I've, definitely, I've definitely seen kind of an inflection point. So uh, Josh, uh, building on uh, John's point and, and the panel's point, is it more like um, Amazon uh, who is asking all of their employees, I believe, to, to come back? Uh, along with some of the major banks, perhaps in New York, uh, where uh, you are right now? Uh, or is it uh, more like some of the, the technology firms in San Francisco, uh, where folks can uh, work uh, from home full time? Uh, how's Skanska seeing it? It's a great question. I, I, it occurred that I didn't probably give my, my full introduction. I'm, I'm a vice president of strategy. I'm head of research and strategy for the, the, you know, the North American the developer group at Skanska. And so this has been a question that's probably been uh, front of mind since like I couldn't go into the office. I mean, in fact, I still remember the day where I was literally standing at J in the terminal of JFK to board an airplane to fly to LA where we got this corporate halt that we couldn't travel anymore. I had to Uber home and little did I know how long it'd be before I'd ever get on an airplane again. And, um, you know, we, we were very quickly into this whole world of, of virtual meetings, right? We, we had the software before and, we, you know, it's funny, Scanska being a global company, um, in my own role of being on, like I'm centric on the single public strategic services team in the corporate operations. So I had to be, I was co I'm covering all the markets. I'm also in charge of new market openings, which basically means I had to be a lot of places and I had to be present. So it's in a weird way, this brought everybody else into my world. Like, and all of a sudden there was greater equality. And the one thing that I, I made this statement back in, I deleted it by April when we were in this, and now I feel like other people are starting to copy it, but I, I hope I can prove I said it over a year ago. And you know, I called it office FOMO, uh, the fear of missing out. See, it's one thing really, everything that's been going on in this year, so maybe I'm, I'm probably agreeing a little bit with Elliot and probably disagreeing with John a little bit in this. I think that um, it worked because there was an equality to it, right? We were all essentially forced to be home. So we all, you know, we could just jump on these calls any time. Scheduling was easy, but we had, a, we had an easy, we, we had an equality in our work setup that um, that, that led, led, I think, things to be productive. But now, yes, we got a lot of work done. We were actually a very productive company in a development unit. We bought stuff, we sold stuff. I mean, we had a pretty good year. Um, and that stands for globally, but at least you know, the global stock, um, you know, EPS, all the, all the things that get reported on the, in Sweden, 2020 was the best year ever, right? We had a couple of big major dispositions, one of them in Seattle and other places. So, I mean, we got work done, even though we all couldn't see each other. Um, when you go, we can start going back, and now that we're, you know, mostly all getting vaccinated, um, and now, you know, I'm seeing now the CDC is lifting the, I just, you know, got the alert on my phone recently that, you know, the CDC is lifting all the mask guidances if you're vaccinated. So, like, um, at, at this point, when people can go in, and I, look, I'm an economist by back training, and I, we did a lot of behavioral, I did a lot of behavioral economics courses. People, do you want to be the person who's, at home zooming in while the other one half 50% is sitting in the office when you're fighting for promotion. Everyone think about, don't think about your, we're all probably more senior people by right of being in a panel like this. Think about that 29 year old. Think about that person fighting for promotion. Think about that person who doesn't necessarily, who needs to fight for FaceTime and whether they're gonna be in. And I, I think that when that, that FOMO kicks in and we get the social side of this, um, I do think that we are gonna see a lot more come back. And by the way, like in, in our own company, 
Uh, we've had a lot of leasing activity. We signed this uh, publicly, public knowledge. We signed a very large lease in, in Houston at the beginning of the year. Frankly, didn't change a lot from the way they were talking to us before all this started. Um, we're having a lot of that. We've seen a big uh, increase in activity. Um, we do think that new space, I think the health and the fact that we can change some of our, our designs and elements to being what we think is the healthiest, most innovative, safe building that we can, we and our architects can come up with right now, we think is a sell point and tenants are responding. Um, I, I wouldn't be shocked if you see a flurry of leasing activity in the next several months, just given the, the early indications. I mean, now, granted, is it net new demand? It could be they're leaving an old building coming to it, you know, right? We talk about gross leasing, but it may be no net absorption. That's, I mean, we don't know, right? That, that's, the, I, I look really, Michael, to you and, and your company a little bit more to, and the various data providers to tell me if I've got net absorption or if I just happen to get lucky and sign sure. a lease. I can't tell from my seat. Um, so I think that we're we're moving into this normal that I, I just kind of feel that where, where I do see interesting changes and, and there is some risk here is that, I mean, you know, a lot of these work from home policies were unofficial, right? It was like your manager lets you if you traveled a lot. I mean, I worked from home quite a bit because, I mean, we didn't, you know, we only had a small corporate team in New York. It wasn't a development market. So it wasn't a lot of, in fact, I realized, God, I probably was going in some days and I got less done because it was just allowed, you know, we didn't want not maybe didn't, couldn't find a private, a quiet space that day. So I think we're going to be more conscious about how we work because we saw the difference. Um, I do. I think John made a great point about what happens to the competitors. I just say, hey, do you you want to be a work from home employee? You got to you know come work for me. Or conversely, hey, you want to be an office employee? Great, come work for me. I mean, I I do think that that's going to be a um, a new design battle, and I, I think that uh, that's going to be a big change. But I I just think it's got to the social cohesion the factor that. I think it's going to be really depressing to be a work from home employee, unless you're just that type that you're a natural, maybe more introverted, maybe you have much more of a job where you got to need. And look, a lot of us in maybe the, the economics data space, we need to write stuff like, great, I got an excuse to be at home with my private office. But I think for the bulk of the office markets, I mean, WeWork was a success. We work at successful spaces, right? Forget what Adam Newman maybe did or didn't do, but I mean, they were successful spaces because people wanted that cohesion, right? That was real. If you had anyone ever spent any time in one of those places, I have a hard time believing we're just not, we, we want to be with people. And I think you look at the, tra if the travel world is any indication, which is I went home to Fl Florida is my original home. I went home not long ago. I think we're going to, I think that people are just going to want to be sitting next to each other. And that, that is something that um, by choice, people are going to want to be in proximity, whether it's the same type of office, that's the big question. That's terrific. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah I just, jump in, John. To jump in there, I think um, I, I would say, I'm not saying the office is dead. I, I think um, the office hasn't changed much in decades. But yes, fitness centers have been added and rooftops and, and lead and Energy Star, et cetera, but they're mainly very gray <laughs> that for someone to kind of want to show up. 40 hours a week to the same exact space, going through the same routine every single day. I, I, I actually think my former colleague, Scott Homo, it's his kind of prediction six or seven years ago is actually gonna come sooner to, 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 to execution, but flex, to, flex is the key thing, right? Em, employees want diversity. Employees want flexibility. Employees don't always wanna show up to sit next to their colleagues. <laughs> They want different levels of engagement, of creativity, of, um, of collaboration. I'm, I'm right now in a co-working space um, where this co-working space is probably 75% occupied. And let me, um, I'm let more me, likely to yeah. become, I want to be here more often than I want to be in my corporate office because so I'm like-minded people that have that same, but my office here is one third the size. Yeah, which, which is okay. Um, so let me ask you, let's get into the panel and thank you all for your prognostications, range of opinions, which uh, I was really pleased to see. Um, how do we figure it out? That, that's really the question for this panel. Uh, certainly, uh, CoStar likes to help you figure it out. Uh, I can tell you that. But how do each of you figure it out? What are your go-to data sources uh, now? What are some of the new unique data sources that you're thinking about and how do we think about sort of employee preferences and some of the themes that each of you uh, started? So let's start with Elliot. Um, how is Kilroy uh, thinking about what um, employers um, want to provide employees and just what types of data 
uh, on a daily or a weekly or a quarterly basis are you and your colleagues uh, looking at? Yes, yeah, so it, it's kind of a, there's a lot of different ways to take that question and it kind of depends on what you're exactly you're talking about. I'd say from my seat, you know, one of the ways that we are looking at data and using data on the investment side is, and put the pandemic aside for a second, is how markets are evolving, right? And regardless of uh, what's happened in the last 14 months, because that will throw a curveball in how markets are going to change from here on out, things are constantly evolving, right? And, and take any market that you're in, things are always going to tilt south, tilt west, tilt east, and it's on us to kind of figure that out. Um, and so when we do that, we're looking at really, really things, you know, inside the office space, but also outside the office space. What's happening on the multifamily side? Where are the developers going? What are the migration trends? Where are the best restaurants? Um, what's happening in infrastructure? There, there are all these other important aspects to how cities and markets are changing that will hopefully give us a leading indicator of how office users are going to change their um, demand patterns. So Rivthi, uh, I know that Cushman has a wealth of data at its fingertips. Tell me about, given the role that you have, the ways in which, uh, thinking about what Elliot just talked about, how you're thinking about these evolving trends, the types of data either proprietary or um, uh, through public uh, services or uh, generally available that you and your colleagues are looking at to sort of figure out uh, current demand trends and where the future of office demand is. Absolutely, and I completely agree with Elliot. Uh, we are kind of, when we're kind of looking at data buckets, the first data bucket that I suppose everyone would look at is kind of underlying drivers, right? So we keep track of demographics, we keep track of technology trends, we keep track of capital because that kind of overrides a lot of things in the direction of travel on that is, is kind of key. And then to John's point earlier, you know, what's interesting about this market is none of these shifts have come out of nowhere, right? All of these shifts that we are talking about kind of, uh, you know, working from home, technology, suburbanization, all of these things were in motion pre-pandemic. What pandemic has done is probably accelerated all of it. And so when we're trying to figure out what that change of pace of acceleration is, that's when we look at kind of more high frequency data. So for example, John mentioned the mobility data, you know, we are all over that as well. We Which, look at what type of mobility data are you talking about? UPS, are you talking about Google? What, what, are, what are you looking at? So we look at everything. We look at the Google data. We look at the Apple data. We look at Castle, uh, Castle card. You know the swiping. Uh, office Everyone office. seems to be looking at the Castle cards, right? Yeah. We look at our own occupancy data. You know, which chimes uh, very well with John's point that even pre-pandemic, you know, occupancy levels, depending on who you talk to, range from kind of seventy to eighty-five percent. Um, we, are, we are also looking at USPS and migration data and trying to track, you know, how much, how many people are migrating. Are they migrating? Is everyone really moving from California to Texas and there's nobody left in California or are they just moving to the suburbs? But more importantly, I think, and this is the real question for me and perhaps why we've got such a range of opinions is how much of this will be reversed, right? So that's, that's the question and that's what I'm, and, and I think you just hit the nail on the head based upon what you all said is how much of this will be reversed and what are you looking at to determine high frequency how it's reversing, or from a secular standpoint, whether um, everyone's going to be working from their kitchen. Yeah, and so one of the things that, you know, when you're talking about working from office, I'd love to come back to the office. I can't because my two kids are in the rooms next door and I have to go and make sure they are on their classroom. But, um, you know, so that's another driver, right? So hopefully in the fall, and that's why I think a lot of employers are kind of saying, you know, everybody needs to come back in the fall because it's linked to the fact that, you know, uh, uh, children will be hopefully vaccinated by then, 12 to 15 year olds have been opened up today and children will be back in school. Um, but I think there's no doubt that there will be some residual effects because 
you know, um, I, I, I think, you know, you talked about kind of promotions, right? And there was a study done by a Stanford a professor called Professor Bloom, and he looked at call centers and he compared a controlled group, those who went back into the office, and a group who worked from home. And what was interesting was that productivity statistics, no difference. But the people who were in office got promoted more. You know, so when you're all kind of looking at these things, it's it's kind of interesting and really I have no answers. So just looking at the data and trying to figure out direction of travel. Josh or John, um, uh, productivity. Uh, are you looking at data that is studying? Certainly we're seeing some of the major consultancies. I think PwC, for example, has been surveying and putting out some results on what employers and employees want. But have either of you been looking at productivity data of employers and employees to sort of figure out what has been an opaque environment? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll figure a quick answer. I, I, yeah. Anecdotally, we are tracking every safe. In fact, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I think of um, JP Morgan and, and uh, Jamie Dimon's yep. statement which I have to think about who, I mean, if, I, if I wonder who J, if JP Morgan's going to give promotions to, if it's going to be the people who are in the office or five, he, I was thinking of that one. I don't think he, think he gave away the ghost on that one. Um, you know, I, the productivity thing, it's an interesting, I, I've been, I've been reading a lot of anecdotal studies and I remember, in fact, I said this and I was almost, I just, you know, it, maybe, maybe it was PTSD from all the 2000s. I, I was in the business through 08. I remember way that downturn, all things I was working in a boutique investment banking shop. And I remember like the, like it was like when the world, that's why I, why I got a PhD and became, went into the research strategy world. It was like got a, a headline of 08. And I remember hearing them, I remember there was a Morgan Stanley CEO who I think it was like April, maybe May, who said, oh, we are so productive working from home. This is like two months in the pandemic. This is great. And I kept thinking to myself like, well, you know, I'm sure everybody who's sitting at home working for a large financial company, right, who has any memory of this is probably working double time or more because they're afraid of, they don't want to be the one who's not, logging into every single thing, doing double the work, because they don't know what's coming down the line, right? Especially back then, people who knew what layoffs or what was going to, you were in the, especially you were in the financial sector like that, which has such a history with, you know, in the last 10 years or, or, or a little bit more than 10 year memory, I could only imagine what the stress I'd be like at a firm like that. I'm thinking to myself, the CEO is making the statement, I'm like, give it three or four, five, six months, they're going to be burnt out. And that's actually what I think happened was, I think that this uh, Zoom technology. Like I, I came from an from the academic world for a while, and like I, I was teaching a, um, a, a an adjunct course last term. That when it became an online class, I can tell you right now, people's ability to pay attention to this. I know we're keeping this to fifty minutes. Like people cannot do this at the same. The, the mental taxingness, and I've seen studies on this. There is a limitation. Now it is more productive on some levels, but there is an absolute boundary to it. The longer that we stay and call it lockdown and don't have some of this, I think productivity is going to be, you know, we call it a U-shaped curve, right? It'll be one you know, or maybe an inverted U, right? It'll have increased because we were forced to switch into it. But I have a suspicion that if, th if this were honest to God, the most productive way to work, we would be doing it. Somebody would have figured this out. This is not new technology. Let me ask John that um, then, because John has been, he opened up with talking about, and thank you, Josh. John has been talking about doing a lot of modeling. And I think of the panelists, John took the, the sort of position that office is absolutely going to change um, and that this is not a new phenomenon. Productivity, John, sort of some of the data sources that you are modeling and thinking about, uh, and why are you in a tiny little office, um, uh, all joking aside? Uh -huh. yeah, that, by the way, that's great. So I contradicted myself. Uh, but um, so one, I, I think I could not agree more with what everyone said. It, for, for me personally, the, the, the real estate is the cherry on the top, right? No tenant wakes up in the morning and essentially says like, I'm anxious to make a real estate leasing decision. They wake up saying, I need to think about my talent, my business, my customer segmentation, et cetera. And so for us, what, what Ravithi, Elliot, you know, Josh, I'll kind of all reference, the real, we call it real estate adjacent, but the real estate adjacent data is, is such kind of gold. And in my view, something that the industry has not leveraged at the extent that other industries have. Um, we're looking at those kind of real estate adjacent data sets kind of like a hedge fund would, 
spending a, a lots of money on in terms of the investment and acquisition of them because those are the drivers for real estate markets. And, and to Elliot's point before, right? You, you, to, to look at where markets are going, you have to look at the drivers as it relates to population, business segmentation, infrastructure, demographics, whatever it might be. But they're also much more comprehensive, accurate, real-time micro database. So, so that I think is, is kind of key. On the productivity lens, what's been interesting in terms of monitoring our own um, you know, 5,000 people is that um, what you could see, and this is a challenge, right? The, the type of environment we've all been in the past 14 months, the, especially what you'd call like the 50% of companies, you know, the, the 20, 60, 20 rule, right? The, the, really the 50% who kind of drive most of the momentum, those people are working at productivity levels that are unsustainable. And once you kind of bring back things like a commute, like the water cooler and what you did over the weekend, how the kids' soccer game was on Saturday morning, there's a potential impact on productivity that is, is pretty high, um, maybe kind of short term, but, and maybe that to, to Ray with these point kind of fuels a whole level new of kind of growth. But that's something to kind of watch out for just because that, that you know, there, there are no boundaries anymore, right? The, the boundaries go Monday to Sunday, uh, set, you know, at all times of the day. So basically what you're saying is we've done some of our most important Zoom meetings wearing pajama bottoms is, 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 really, what, <laughs> is really what you're saying. And, or whatever and, your choice is, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry, quick interjection. I've heard now, and I think even Arkham is in some service where now they're starting to think about policies about like, no Zoom Fridays or trying to like yes. now the, the, the work life man the, the you know the, the HR world that manages this internally is starting to send management the, the notes that be careful this will this will end badly if you don't force it correct now. Ellie, you were going to say something. You know, yeah, well, one thing I, I think John made an excellent point, and I think it's one thing you know we're on a panel to talk about data and analytics, yep. and I think John's point is one that we should keep in mind where the data on productivity i agree but there's uh is is being more productive the best route for for people is it is it the right long term you know the short term productivity and the long term productivity are different and so i think that's an instance where just looking at the analytics might not tell you the right answer that is uh, all right i, I want to move on and i'm going to i'm going to go to uh, with the, with the next question, which is prop tech. So we're sort of talking about data and obviously at the end of the last cycle, we were beginning to get all of this great data from buildings. Um, the buildings were starting to tell us very insightful um, pieces of information about the ways that tenants are using it. Um, why don't I start with you uh, and perhaps you can talk a little bit away Cushman, because it has probably access to a lot of prop tech data. What what's sort of the most interesting for you on the data front? What's sort of been your go-to um, on, on that front to sort of figure out how this is evolving? So, uh, you know, we've got a, a smart buildings advisory team that kind oh. of helps, uh, you know, that helps uh, uh, corporate owners and landlords actually kind of, uh, you know, monitor you know, basic things like energy consumption, HVAC, and all the facilities management data and the asset management data, and we track all of that. And from a data and analytics perspective, what we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of pull all the data sources together. So one of the advantages of being a full service firm like Cushman is that we touch a property from every side, right? We buy it, we sell it, we rent it out, we property manage it, we value it. Um, and, uh, you know, we do, we do corporate occupier solutions. And each of those kind of service lines generate so much data. Each valuation, for example, generates 9,000 data points per property. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to A, capture our own internal data, which is very powerful, connect it across service lines, marry it with third party data, for example, a COSTA data or you know, USPS data, RCA data, migration data, to try and kind of pull together this, this kind of whole holistic picture of, of kind of what's happening. 
And we're also using prop tech to drive, to drive forward businesses, right? Because the first thing that happened in, during the pandemic is you couldn't go visit a property. So we've tie, we have a relationship with a firm called Matterport that lets you do kind of 360 virtual tours, which is fantastic. We've also uh, got a relationship with a firm called Placer AI, which tracks, tracks foot traffic for retail data. So it kind of tells you how many people are going by, you know, not only your property, but the Starbucks next door and the Starbucks in the neighboring submarket. And tying all of that data together starts becoming powerful. Elliot, uh, PropTech, what, what sort of are you finding the most instructive for you and your colleagues? in terms of so, the data that you're getting from your buildings. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because we kind of break prop tech up into the data and analytics component and then kind of the solutions component. And I'd say on the solution side, we it's a little more black and white because at the end of the day, we, we look at What's our job? Our job is to operate our buildings as efficiently as possible. And to the extent we can take a solution, for example, an energy management solution, that's really black and white on how you use it, what the return is or isn't, how it makes you better at you know do, doing your day job. And that is probably where we spent a little bit more time. On the data and analytics, I'd say we've generally been relying more on internal data uh, because one, that's I think the, the lower hanging fruit for us. And two, we are having, we're trying to figure out exactly how we, we monetize um, data on how people are using our space, right? You know, given the nature mm. of what we do, we're not pre-building tons of space uh, like a co-working company would. We do some of that, but it, it's not, um, it's not the majority of how we lease our space. And so um, I'd say we're, we're not quite as uh, in depth at, you know, how we use data or how we monetize data because we haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, but it is something we continue to spend time on. John, I know you also, like Cushman, have a lot of data at your fingertips. And I think you're taking a very, sort of almost a econometric approach uh, to using all your data. Um, I don't want to get wonky here, but, you know, I don't uh, either. <laughs> and then I do want to get wonky with Josh uh, about the way that they're thinking about development decisions, obviously. But uh, John, uh, in terms of uh, data coming out of buildings, out of prop tech, um, what would convince you that, um, the, the, the demise of office, for lack of a better word, uh, is a fallacy, or what are you seeing uh, other than key card swipes that uh, are really informing you and your colleagues uh, vision for, uh, 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 sorry, uh, thoughts on the office market from a data perspective? Well, Michael, I mean, we're, we're in an interesting industry where to, to be quite candid outside of you guys, the industry for decades has largely been a relationship-based sector. Um, and I think a lot of us are trying to kind of shift that to a, a knowledge-based sector. Uh, you guys have been trying to do that for a long period of time. Others of us have been trying to do the same too, but um, we're in that kind of early stages of that. Uh, we, in my view, there's, there's no comparison from a CRE perspective to a banking and finance perspective with data analytics, the insight kind of derived from that. We're literally not even in the first inning. Um, so, I think a lot of entities in the market, occupier, investor, developer, public sector, service firms, et cetera, they're trying to understand how to utilize data. We're, we're kind of still at that first stage. Right, does research still matter? You know, does research matter, I guess, for all of us who are researchers, you know, um, yeah. certainly think, the evolution of research over the last 20, think, 30 years. Michael, to that, is, and what, what Elliot said, I think a lot of prop techs are, are focused on the solution and the tech without the data. And there's, in my view, there's a great, great point, great point. Prop techs out there that have really good ideas, usually in a lane like that. Um, but they're focused on the solution and the mechanism to build the architecture and infrastructure, but now how to fuel it. And th that, that to me is a, it's a big opportunity. It kind of goes to what Ravis 
said to before is that the, the opportunistic kind of entities are the ones who are kind of like the IoT. They're connecting kind of all those different um, segregated kind of elements that the unique thing about our industry, location, location, location. And I bring that up because every data point we care about, at least personally, 100% of it's geo-based. Let me, so let me again, enter. That's, not, that's, that's not just real estate, but that's like what I call real estate adjacent. Everything's geo-based. And so that means there's actually a fundamental connector in our industry that exists, a geo-based data point that doesn't exist in many other industries. So there's a huge opportunity. No one's, you guys have obviously done a, a great job, but no one's Thank done you. the job of kind of connecting all those different elements. Kind of, I think it's right with the, as you kind of said, so, so eloquently. Well, we are, we are trying to uh, provide value for the industry and we have a visionary CEO, of course. Um, I wanna though turn to uh, Josh uh, and Josh, you're a developer, you build, you're trying to make decisions uh, in a very opaque uh, environment. And so you tell us, you know, whether it's prop tech uh, or it's other data sources. And, I, and I, I think your colleagues on the panel have shared really good insight so far. What are you and your colleagues looking at to make go, no go decisions? Should we wait? Should we not wait? Is this market not coming back to the extent we think it is? Or is it coming back faster? How are you making those decisions? And what data are you thinking about and using? You know, it's, it's a great question. And look, we certainly, um, we have all the major data providers, obviously CoStar, which we're subscribers there. So we certainly want to be on the, you know, have our fingers for that. Um, we definitely appreciate all that our various brokers are doing. I know John, I know you guys are doing, I've seen some of your, your recent product. I've seen Cushman puts out lots of research and work. So we try to- Really good research. Not, we, don't want, we don't want to be a victim of not seeing something that's out there um, that's available. You know, we, we are looking at, um, like one of the ones that we've done where we, we recently are, are building in is a group called Spatial AI that does, um, a, it, it sort of uses social media geotech, geocoded data. And we got, I mean, our, in, in since my time, I've been with Scan for just about two years, and we've added besides myself, who comes sort of from a you know economic data scientist background, uh, we've added more people. We have a director of innovation spot, which actually it's actually currently open, as we're, we're looking to fill. But we've had a role that role's existed. Um, we looked a lot more more at the prop tech, meaning the physical building tech. So I mean, when we look at a decision, we want a building. It's it's a fundamental belief that I mean. Tenants want to be in the best building, right? That there's a premium that that the the building that that best serves the customer needs gets leased first. Um, hopefully, it's at a rent. I mean, our biggest challenge is always does it come at a rent that justifies that investment? And that's you know, and frankly, for when we're making decisions multiple years out, I mean, there there is there's no way to do the development business without taking some risks and understanding that you know a little bit. I, I don't I do not want to compare us to Apple, but I mean, at the same time, it's like we have to make a product. And make decisions today based upon what somebody is going to want tomorrow. Yeah, that's that's. And, that's, there, and I'll just I'll just go ahead and answer the question. Anyone who's watching this and thinking about data, I mean, if there was one data source that could just give you that answer, they would charge the most fantastic rate for that data price. That you know, you, no one could buy it, right? So, and, and if anyone discovers it, you know, call me up. We'll make you a deal. Don't call anybody else up, please. But that's um, why you have these super smart people on yeah, the panel it, to interpret all the data that's exactly out there. Right. And, but, but you're always making these choices. So like for me, you know, obviously I, I think the social, like from you know, the big, a question that we would always ask ourselves, right? I think a lot, and I guarantee we're not the only developer doing this, but is, you know, can we spot the next Brooklyn, right? Can we spot the next, can we spot Nashville before it's Nashville, Austin before it's Austin, right? Well, I remember once that back when I was in, on the academic side, I was at a panel and, um, you know, somebody asked me the question, hey, how do you find the next Denver, right? And, and um, you know, actually one of the data points, I think this would have predicted Denver pretty well that I like to follow because it does, it can be high frequency, but it doesn't. All where marijuana is being legalized. That's right. That wasn't where I was going to go. Actually, um, it was actually aviation, and actually, I think that um, travel. And I'm actually, I mean, I'm a very, I believe in the Aristotelian theory of, of city growth a lot. I think that city connectivity, and in fact, if anything, uh, the pandemic where people realize that maybe I just need to be close enough, and I can move an office or move people. And I've watched, I, you know, look. Talking about moves to Texas and Florida, you did not need a pandemic to make that a trend, but clearly people are realizing that maybe I don't need to be in the city in my background. Um, I'm not predicting, by the way, I think New York will be fine, but um, I think that that those elements were, we're really looking for data that maybe gives us an idea, like, you know, that's where like the social media type data is like, 
hey, the kind of cool kids that are checking in that maybe pre-predicted the book club, like, you know, we think that the coffee shop or the, the sort of the, um, the trendy spot might take off. So that's something that we would look at. Um, in our buildings, you know, and also this, is, I don't know if this has been said yet, but one of the biggest areas of data that we are trying to get, and we both our own buildings and you know, we sell a building and we want to keep our data, which is a tough thing, but sustainability, energy use measures. I and mean, that's, I mean, for, for Stanska, it's a huge part of our brand. A lot of cities are requiring, like New York is there, DC, all these cities are going this direction. So we want to deliver the most, I mean, we, we have a drive to get to net zero buildings, right? I mean, we have our, 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 our company as a net zero, you know, as a, as a carbon neutral pledge by 2020 five and all these things so we are one of our we think that there's a huge tie into the building the tech the envelope right i mean like and, and you know the, what operating system how does that tie in how do you prove that you're building i mean here's a question how does your building prove that you actually live up to these benchmarks that you've been trying to set so that's a big thing that we look at and i mean the tenant experience i think it's always a question of what you know literally a question every project team we have is what app is going to run this office with, right like which you know what is the tenant experience going to be how does it tie into these um, amenity spaces? So we, you know, we, we, I mean, I kind of envision a day where literally people will be deciding, is this building going to be operated on the Apple platform, the Microsoft platform? Mm -hmm. Like, I literally think that um, we are going to get to that place where, where so, so for our question, we're a developer and we're providing, you know, we build a core and shell, right? And then a tenant comes in and they decide how it's going to integrate. So wired score we have a we're in a partnership where we're trying to get all of our buildings you know the highest grade of a wired scored um metric which sort of measures the building's connectivity technological backbone um try to get the best score we can right so the tenant can then come and say no matter what their needs for internet capacity security etc they have the power usage whatever it is uh they're set to go so that's you know, we that, that's it so we look at that tech infrastructure in there and we, we that's great the top tech space is where will some of the answer will come from let me, um, uh, we're getting short on time here, and uh, I want this to go on for as long as we can, because this is uh, a joy, uh, but we have about five minutes left. Uh, it's amazing how time goes when you're talking to uh, just really interesting people. But um, two questions I want to ask. First, uh, if you can, in 30 seconds or less, John, uh, Elliot, um, what has surprised you the most in the data in the last 14 months? Uh, and then I'm going to go to Cushman because uh, I, I know you have lots and lots of data. Uh, but uh, John, you as well. What's yeah. been most surprising for you both? Most surprising to me is the, the variation in terms of occupancy, office occupancy levels pre-COVID. Um, and I would just kind of add to that. I, I think also, you know, one element in terms of uh, data that the, the industry is going to be a lot more smarter on in the future is the perceptional data of tenants. Because obviously that's you know a little bit unstructured, but we don't do a good job as an industry in terms of really understanding what the tenant wants, and that's part, by the way part of firms our sectors fault, meaning Raventhe and, and ours. That decision making is largely made by 0.001 percent of, of tenants. Uh, the, the common employee doesn't really have a say in terms of what they need or want in an office space. So that kind of perceptional data, not just for a managing director, a CEO, a CFO, et cetera, I think is just enormous potential in terms of how the future of office is kind of looked at. Ellie, what's most surprised you in the last 14 months of the data? Yeah, I guess I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. I guess what surprised, what has surprised me the most is how the interpretation of the data has not looked through the lens of like practicality. And what I mean by that is it, it when you look at migration patterns out, out of New York or San Francisco, that's a very logical thing when cities are locked down, people aren't commuting into offices, there's no place to go. That, that seems logical. What has surprised me is how that has often been extrapolated into long-term secular trends. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But I'm not sure that looking at the last 14 months is a fair indication of, of what is to come. Nail on the head. Nail on the head. Thank you, Ellie. That, and then uh, Ruvathi, uh, either agreeing with Elliot or, or disagreeing with the panel, what's most surprised you in all the data that you look at? 
So for me, it's not so much the data, but really the pace of adoption of the tools and technology that kind of generate the data that's been truly mind boggling for me. Um, you know, within Cushman, you know, obviously we've got kind of the data and the tools, but the thing that we haven't talked about is the change management element to get the people to kind of A, use the tools, capture the data and kind of make it all part of the ecosystem. And that's been like, like chalk and cheese. Um, you know, just the way the people have embraced the data and the technology and everything that it generates. And I think. So this is one of the issues with uh, doing Zoom meetings uh, is that sometimes our panelists uh, will freeze up. So uh, in 15 seconds or less, Elliot, John, Josh, predictions for the office market. Elliot. I think going back to where we started, uh, whether it's 2021 or 2022, when we're sort of in our new normal, I think our new normal will look a lot more like 2019 than it will 2020. John? Flex and diversity. Uh, flex in terms of people's habits, diversity. Um, every college grad in the East Coast wanted to go to Manhattan historically. Is that we still do. We all do. We don't know that. We don't answer that. So I, I think um, or San Francisco. I, I think they're going to be an evolving the office sectors that emerge from this that we're not even thinking of. So Boise. Boise was emerging before before the pandemic. <laughs> uh, Josh, are we coming to New York? Or are we going to Boise? Or what, what? You get the last word here. Difficult one. I, I actually think that when we. When we you know, predictions after these big things like uh, no one will travel after 9-11, there won't be new high rises, or after 08, no one will buy houses again, didn't really do so well. So I kind of think that, you know, any prediction that there'll be a, a big reduction of office, I'd be, I would couch it in that same uh, cautionary tale. So I guess my prediction is I actually think that there's an equal probability, I'm not going to say it's a guarantee, but an equal probability that three years from now we'll see greater demand from office than we did in, say, 2019. I think it is at least equal probability that of less at this point. I like those conviction calls. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for an excellent discussion, one that I wish would go on longer, but we are uh, at our 50-minute uh, time frame. Uh, certainly, uh, we're going to uh, turn it back over uh, to sort of wrap here, but I want to thank you all for uh, your very thoughtful answers. Uh, certainly, I would love to continue this uh, dialogue uh, offline, and I know all of our attendees uh, are interested to sort of engage with you all as well. So I would encourage uh, folks to reach out with additional questions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our conference organizer uh, to sort of wrap us here. And again, thank you to our panelists. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael. A very big thank you to all of our panelists and a special thank you to Michael for moderating. I know the audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause because that was awesome content. So thank you all for taking the time to share with us today. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.